So it is a pleasure for us to have uh, Professor uh, Jan Atkinson with us and Oliver Brade, and Professor so Oliver Brade with us. Um, and I'll present them before they start the talk. So um, uh, Professor uh, Janet Atkinson is uh, holding uh, currently a few, uh, a multiple professorship uh, positions. She's an emeritus professor of psychology and, develop and developmental visual cognitive neuroscience at UCL in the UK. She's also a visiting professor at the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford and a research scientist at UCSD. She's won, uh, received numerous prestigious awards and memberships, including the, uh, visual, uh, the Visual Sciences Society 2016 Davida Teller Award, which I was, uh, um, I had the honor to be present and I'll tell you some anecdotes about that. She's also an elected fellow of the British Academy and many other academies and prestigious awards. She's held uh, numerous academic positions in prestigious universities in the UK and abroad. Um, she was also active uh, via uh, senior academic and administrative positions in promoting women in science, which is something that is close to my heart, uh, through Athena Swan initiatives, uh, promoting women in STEM, gender equality, etc. She's published hundreds of publications in uh, prestigious uh, journals, in um, books, book chapters, etc. Um, um, Professor um, Oliver Braddock is also holding uh, multiple um, uh, professors has held and is just a minute. I'll do that. Um, Uh, multiple professorships in uh, numerous academic um, and top uh, top universities at the moment. He is um, um, an emeritus professor at the Univers Oxford University and at, um, at Magdalene. Magdalene Oxford, uh, College Oxford. Uh, he's uh, been awarded multiple prestigious awards. He's a fellow of the British Academy. He's held uh, multiple um, editorial positions in esteemed journals as current biology, perception, vision research, journal of vision, quarterly journal of experimental psychology and others. Um, He's also published hundreds of papers in top journals. And today we're delighted to have you with us uh, to join us in this uh, vision uh, science, in the uh, Bar-Ilan University Vision Science Seminar. I want to add an anecdote that I was, um, again, I was, um, I'm actually uh, honored to uh, have been uh, present in Jan's talk in the David Teller Award. And I remember one, it was a fascinating talk. And one thing that I do remember, and maybe I'm, my uh, memory is um, not that precise, but that you mentioned there that the first paper you had was, uh, uh, or maybe it wasn't the first, but you ha you uh, investigated your daughter uh, and she was also an author with you on that paper, both of you. And that was, <laughs> that struck me. Uh, it was really amazing. And to think how far science has gone since then. Um, <laughs> And I also want to mention to our audience that um, um, Jan and Oliver have asked that if you have questions, you can write them in the chat and at the end, they will be able to answer all the questions. They would prefer that you don't disturb them during the talk. And so welcome to our seminar. Thank you. Hello. Um, Sharon did forget to say that we were husband and wife, but I think oh. most of you know that. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's hundreds of papers where almost all of them co-authors, so don't try and add them linearly. <laughs> okay, sorry I missed that point. <laughs> we're, we're going to talk today about um, some questions that we still have. We've done quite a lot of work on visual development, um, but we still have a lot of questions. We're going to start by showing a short video, which lasts about five minutes. Um, some of you may have seen this before, so I apologize for that. It's slightly historic 
because the video was started and has been modified many times since we first uh, filmed some of these uh, babies. This is actually done live. And so the quality is a bit mixed because filming babies when they're actually doing something is quite tricky. And uh, I hope you like this and it will give you some idea of the techniques we're using. Then all will speak and then I'll speak after that. How do infants develop their visual abilities so rapidly? And how can we assess the underlying changes in the eye and brain? These questions have been the focus of research by the interdisciplinary team at the Visual Development Unit, first founded by Jan Atkinson and Oliver Braddock in Cambridge University, and later in University College London and the University of Oxford. An informal, friendly setting where children can sleep, feed and play provides the environment where we can get the best results. We first used automated preferential looking to measure baby security and contrast sensitivity, showing how these basic capacities increase greatly in the first months of life. But the most important changes are in the development of the brain as a wealth of connections form in the visual cortex. We use steady state VEPs to show the onset in the first months after birth of responses to orientation a key function of the visual cortex. Our fixation shift test of the ability to disengage readily from a central target shows another side of cortical development, the increasing control over subcortical processes. In new work, we use an eye tracker and high density EEG to monitor these shifts of attention. Jan Atkinson and Oliver Braddock used these findings to develop their neurobiological model of development from birth through the first year of life. Cortical modules emerge progressively in both the dorsal and the ventral stream and modulate subcortical circuits. The dorsal stream, pink, controls developing visual action systems. At the same time, attentional systems, blue in the diagram, are linked in so that the baby can control her visual behavior. One major cortical function is binocularity, combining the signals from left and right eyes to give stereo depth. We began, in collaboration with Bela Ulis, using random dot correlograms to find the onset of binocular vision between three and four months of age. We studied the failure of binocularity in strabismus when the eyes become misaligned. Strabismus and amblyopia are often linked to long-sighted refractive errors in the first year of life. The VDU pioneered the method of video refraction, which can detect these problems rapidly and safely. In two screening programs of over 8,000 nine-month-olds, long-sighted infants were 10 times more likely to develop squint or poor vision by four years of age. By wearing spectacles in infancy, many of these problems can be prevented. To measure acuity in these young children, we developed the Cambridge crowding cards to assess the visual crowding that is a common feature of amblyopia in children. Vision goes beyond these basic functions to a wealth of specialised brain areas, which divide into the ventral stream for recognising objects and faces, and the dorsal stream, which processes motion and space to control actions like reaching and grasping. We can test the development of these streams using babies' EEG responses to global form and global motion patterns. By the time children are three or four years old, they can pick out the ball in the grass which measures their sensitivity to global form and global motion. In many developmental disorders, including Williams syndrome, autism and dyslexia, children are much more less of a motion task, indicating the particular vulnerability of the dorsal stream in development. The dorsal stream is involved in many aspects of vision, including the control of spatial attention. We have developed ECAB, the early childhood attention battery, which for the first time dissects the different components of attention in children as young as three. This visual search task, find the red apples, tests the development of selective attention. For a different component of attention, sustained attention, the child has to keep looking for animals in a long sequence of pictures. Attention also involves control by the frontal lobes. In this counterpointing task, the child needs inhibitory control of a prepotent response to touch the target 
when he's told that he has to touch the opposite side of the screen. The dorsal stream also translates visual information into action, such as guiding the rotation of the hand to post a card through an angled slot in the postbox test, or the instant visual judgments that are needed to walk smoothly downstairs. We can analyse these actions with an infrared motion capture system and study why children, such as those with Williams syndrome, have such difficulty with these everyday tasks. Of course, many tasks require integration of dorsal with ventral stream information. In this spatial memory task, the child has to remember the spatial layout as he moves or the board rotates. In this blocks task, the child uses ventral information to recognise a shape, but the dorsal stream to guide the actions that construct it. This is one subtest from our ABCDEFE battery for assessing children's functional vision. In basic vision, visuomotor integration and visually based cognition, there are a host of questions to be answered about both typical and atypical development. The goal of our work is to maximise visual enjoyment of the world around us for every child. Okay, so we're going to take up some of the lines of work that were described in that, in that short film uh, and point out the extent to which there are unanswered questions and, and new uh, perspectives yeah. that we need to take. Are you going? Am I all right? Am I audible? Yes, 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 there was background noise, so I muted them. Okay. <laughs> so there are several unresolved questions that we're going to talk about today <coughs> um, that appear disconnected but seem to in fact have a common theme. First, we'll ask what role do recurrent pathways play in visual brain development? We'll talk about the relationship between hyperopia and strabismus and we'll ask what do neurodevelopmental disorders have in common? And it will appear that the development of visual attention may be a theme that links all these three apparently disparate areas. So first, recurrent pathways. <clears throat> As we saw in the film, um, there are ways in which we can analyze the basic properties of um, cortical information processing. And we know from animal studies that orientation, direction of motion, and binocular interaction are all features of neurons in V1 that we don't see earlier in the visual pathway. So when we see the development of these responses, um, by both behavioural and electrophysiological methods, we're seeing the development of the early stages of visual cortical processing. Um, this is the um, model that you saw described in the film with a certain amount of updating. Uh, we now recognise that the subcortical systems have direct inputs to global motion. And, and as we'll um, be discussing, local and global motion in B1 and an extra striate, respectively, seem to have a more parallel development than we might have originally thought. Um, now, a feature of the extra striate areas involved in global processing is that they have large receptive fields that integrate information to extract global properties. And we can assess this through thresholds for coherence. In the two cases you see here, uh, here we've got 100% of dots are all taking part in the same rotary motion. And as you go across from left to right, you're getting more and more noise, less and less coherence. And we can determine what level of coherence is necessary to get a response. The second row shows a parallel test for form coherence, where the individual elements are not dots, but little line segments, lark segments. And it again, 100% concentric organization can be degraded by more percent coherence. And in the um, experiment that you saw briefly described in the film, uh, babies can be tested for the transition between coherent and incoherent as to whether that introduces <coughs> uh, an evoked potential, a VERP, at the frequency of this reversal. 
So here are some results of that uh, approach, which we um, published a few years back. Uh, look at the topographical distribution of the signal, for both form coherence and motion coherence. And looking at the five month infants down in the second row, you'll see first that they um, showed responses both to global form and to global motion. So both these levels of global processing were present. Um, that, um, <coughs> that these are different, so they're apparently distinct networks, and that the pattern is quite distinctly different from that we saw across the scalp of adults with the same yeah, Implying then that global processing become, undergoes significant reorganization between infancy and adulthood. So what's the nature of that reorganization? Well, first, let's be clear that our data show that both local motion responses and global res motion responses are present by at least two to three months of age. And we haven't seen any evidence that there is a local to global progression in development with the local processes preceding the global. So there's an interaction between striate and extra striate signals for motion processing. The, as it were, classical textbook view of the visual pathways in the brain is that information from V1 is progressively refined, made more specialized for different areas, different um, um, properties such as color, binocularity and orientation, culminating in um, facial recognition and similar properties in the ventral stream and spatial processing in the dorsal stream. But the notion that these arrows are in one direction is clearly obsolete. Modern uh, studies, I say modern, this has been apparent for at least 20 years, uh, is that all these processes are in fact bidirectional, that recurrent um, pathways, um, sorry, the recurrent pathways go both ways. All the red arrows are accompanied by blue arrows uh, linking two areas. So that these, the system is full of feedback. Now, what about development? Well, the evidence on this is still quite sparse, but Burkhalter in anatomical studies found that between V1 and V2, by four months of age, that forward connections, feed forward connections, already had the laminar structure that was found in maturity, uh, whereas feedback connections were still markedly immature, suggesting that feedback came later. Um, this is also supported by some uh, evoked potential experiments done by John Watton Bell in our lab. Um, where he looked at the sequence following a transient change from, um, a, a, of the onset of motion. And in the infant, he found the initial response was in the um, occipital pole in V1, and that then later spread to extra striate areas, as you see in this sequence here on the left. On the right, however, in the adult, the sequence was quite different. That at the start, there was substantial activation of extra striate areas, and that this became focused uh, in, in the occipital area and with a reverse polarity over um, the course of the, of the um, in, in, um, evolution of this response. So this sequence in the adult is highly suggestive that you're getting feedback from extra striate to striate areas, whereas there's no sign of that in the infant. So the development of feedback seems likely to be a key aspect of development in visual motion processing um, and presumably is also involved in the other visual cortical systems too. Remember all those arrows that we saw in the anatomical diagram went both ways. What function do these recurrent feedback connections serve? Well, there are several suggestions. Uh, one is that they enable global contexts to affect local processing for, topic, for issues such as segmentation and figure ground. They're clearly going to have a key role if predictive coding is present, and that's a rather fashionable idea in visual computation, uh, that predictions had to be fed down to the early stages. And the one we're going to focus on in this talk is that attentional control, we know V1 is modulated by spatial attention, uh, must also be a function of feedback connections from higher areas. Um, Hopefully, we're going to be able to discover more about this in the years ahead uh, as the infant connectome gets us more, de more and more detailed data about how structural connectivity increases with age uh, and how functional connectivity, both between networks and within networks, develops. At some stage, we hope this may be able to distinguish feed-forward connections from feedback connections. Now, I'll lead on to an apparently quite different question. Why does hyperopia, 
or long-sightedness lead to um, a colloquially cross eyes. Binocular integration is a system that involves another form of feedback. Uh, and this is feedback through the ocular motor system. So we know there are cortical neurons that are sensitive to disparity, which subserves stereo vision. Those cortical neurons also provide the signal that drives convergence to bring the eyes aligned. Uh, when the images of the two eyes are superimposed, that allows the computation of disparity. <clears throat> These binocular neurons are the basis for stereo vision. And as the, we were seen, saw in the film, uh, we first see them in typical infants between three and five months of age. And that's in line with a wide range of behavioral evidence that stereoscopic vision is developing around this period. Now, developing, developing normally, but a percentage, small percentage of children develop strabismus like this uh, child here. You can see that his two eyes are not aligned. One is fixating the camera, the other is off in a different direction. So it's a failure of binocularity and ocular motor coordination here. Why should binocularity be vulnerable and break down in this way? Well, that's a function of this loop. And a key element of this loop is that the link between <coughs> the images received from the two eyes and the disparity in neurons is plastic. Uh, that is, we know from animal experiments, that if the images aren't consistently superimposed, uh, superimposed, then this disparity sensitivity breaks down. So if there's any problem either at the neural level or at the ocular motor level, this loop can be broken. And the um, clinical theories of strabismus or clinical practice of strabismus has been long aware of these two types of possibility. In particular, uh, there's a widespread phenomenon called accommodative strabismus. Children who are squints are often also long-sighted, have hyperopia. And the theory goes that hyperopia uh, requires strong accommodation if the child's lens is to focus the eye on nearby objects. Accommodation is linked to convergence, so these children overconverge. Uh, they, if they then fail to superimpose the images, that, plastic, that plasticity, which we mentioned before, will lead to strabismus. And this theory um, has two predictions. One is that hyperopia before the onset of strabismus will increase the risk of strabismus. Uh, and the other is that accommodation by hyperopic infants will also increase the risk of strabismus. These questions can only be answered if you can catch the babies uh, at this early stage. And Jan is now going to talk about some of these studies uh, that we've done that test these ideas. Okay, we start with a screening program that we ran a long time ago on many infants that were nine months of age in a population screening program to measure long-sightedness, short-sightedness, and anisometropia, refractive errors in infancy. And what we found was we use video refraction, and this is a video refractive image of um, hyperopic astigmatism, which you can see as the size of the blur circle or blur ellipse in the video. This can be measured and calibrated to give you a refractive, a measure of refraction. It's a quick test that takes about five minutes uh, with the infant looking at uh, you at the camera. Um, in this screening program, uh, the screening program was run to see whether um, refractive correction uh, could reduce strabismus and amblyopia, which are common problems in infancy, uh, ophthalmological problems. Uh, we ran a randomized control trial with appropriate spectacle correction for significant hyperopia and anisometropia. We followed up these children from four to seven years at four, six, 12 and month intervals. And we ran many other tests besides visual tests and visual measurements, um, uh, cognitive, visual, motor, attention and language. And uh, I'm just going to talk here about the attention measures, uh, the strabismus and amblyopia and the attention measures that were made at uh, six, five to six years. This is the, the results for strabismus and amblyopia in the treated group, which you can see here is uh, on the right of this graph and the non-spectacle non group, which is in the middle. 
There were also a control group that were picked up at the same time in the randomized control trial, which were, had normal refractions at nine months of age. They were followed up as well. You can see that if you look at the yellow uh, panel here um, for amblyopia, you can see that spectacle wear reduced amblyopia quite significantly. You can also see that if you look at the red bars, that strabismus was reduced between the no spectacles group and the spectacles group. So we had had effect on strabismus and amblyopia through this early correction. Now, what about the other aspects of um, uh, accommodation for these infants? We measured accommodation and focusing ability in the hyperopic infants um, at the same time as we ran cycloplegic refractions for getting their uh, um, um, for getting their refractive correction. Um, we found that infant hyperopes were poor accommodators in general, and the infant hyperopes who were poor accommodators became strabismic, as you can see in this uh, bar, this plot on the left, which shows actually that the blue area, there was 14 out of 76 hyperopes who under accommodated, who became strabismic. You can see on the right, the hyperopes who accommodate on target, none of those infants actually became strabismic. So these results do not support the theory that over accommodation in infancy, uh, particularly by infants who are hyper, significantly hyperopic, leads to strabismus. Um, it, rather counteracts the uh, standard ophthalmological argument for um, hyperopes over accommodating. Now, what about attention? Um, we looked at these children, uh, both the controls and the uh, hyperopes at six to seven years. And what we found from looking at a, a standard attention test called the TEACH, the test of everyday attention for children, was that um, children who uh, um, were hyperopic in infancy showed a, a, a poorness of attention on some of these subtests um, at the seven years. So the children who were infant hyperopics, uh, hyperopes showed these mild attention deficits. So why is failure to accommodate linked to later strabismus? Well, there are two debates here and two answers, if you like. Some hyperopic infant children don't accommodate because accommodating produces double vision and they are potential accommodative isotropes. But we think that it's also possible that hyperopia in infancy and significant hyperopia in, in infancy and strabismus is a soft sign of wider cerebral dysfunction. You get poor accommodation and that is reflected in poor, is a reflection of poor attention. So this brings me on to the third question that we're thinking about today. Uh, what do neurodevelopmental disorders have in common? Now I'm taking you back here to the dorsal and ventral stream. And this is a very traditional picture of the dorsal and ventral stream from the initial work of Underliger and Mishkin and Goodale and Milner, where the dorsal stream is much more important for actions, the ventral stream for recognizing objects. And we showed you already the global motion and global form coherence measure that we've made in infants. And this is used as a signature of dorsal versus ventral stream function in older children. Uh, we've tested a large group of children measuring their motion and, motion and form thresholds using the ball in the grass task that you also saw in the video, where the child on each trial has to point to the coherent area on one side or the other, and you can vary the coherence to get a threshold. You can see here on this graph, on one side, there is the London group of children of a 200, around 200 children, and in San Diego, there's 154 children given the same test of the ball in the grass. 
essentially what we're looking at here is the development of uh, global form and global motion thresholds, coherence thresholds to adult levels, which are also shown on the left hand graph. And you can see that the red line for motion is always above the blue line, which means that global motion sensitivity is in general developing more slowly than global form over this age range of around four to 12 years at least. Um, what this means is that we can use this data to obtain norms to look at children with developmental disorders. The first group we looked at was children with Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is an extremely interesting syndrome. It's very rare. It's due to a genetic deletion on chromosome seven. Uh, there are cognitive deficits that are more marked in the visual, motor and spatial domains. And yet these children have re relatively fluent speech, which develops slightly later, but develops up to very good levels of uh, at least 14, uh, 12 to 14 uh, years of age. Um, and then it seems to asymptote for things like metaphors and proverbs. They're very social, hypersocial and very atypical in terms of their personality. And in the visual development unit, our team, we've seen many of these children. Uh, so essentially they've got a range of deficits which are related to the dorsal stream functions. They've got visual problems in terms of strabismus and, um, uh, and, and binocular deficits. They've got problems with visuospatial tasks such as copying block constructions. And they've got problems with just about every action that they perform. And here you show, you show a Williams syndrome child descending stairs. But we tried to make a comparison between dorsal and ventral streams with these two tasks. We use the mailbox, we use the global form and motion task on the right, the same one as I've shown you before with the ball in the grass. And we used a mailbox task or a postbox task as it's called in the UK, which is where the child, first of all, for the dorsal task has to post the card and for the ventral task, has to match the orientation of the slot, which can be varied from trial to trial. What we found is that Williams syndrome children are relatively impaired on both the dorsal stream versions of these tasks in terms of posting and in terms of motion coherence. We thought that this was original and unique to Williams syndrome, but we were very wrong. Um, the dorsal stream motion coherence being poor is a characteristic of many developmental disorders. And if you look across this list here that we've put down from our lab and from many other labs, you can see that it covers both genetic and acquired disorders. And it's pretty common across virtually every neurodevelopment disorder that people examine. Where might this global motion deficit occur? Well, first of all, we go back to normal adult fMRI, which was done met quite a few years ago, where we looked at um, responses of adults um, in, in an fMRI study, uh, looking at the contrast between coherent and incoherent stimuli, rather similar to the ones that we've used in the ball of the drafts task. Um, we found that there were non-overlapping brain networks for global form and global motion. And this looked like as though it was not necessarily just V5MT that was important for deciding this threshold for individuals, uh, but there was a whole network. Uh, we know that from recent work by Sharon and her colleagues, um, that it's not necessarily just V5 and MT, which may not be exclusively dorsal stream areas, and there may be other inputs to that area that may be important. So uh, what brain areas are common typical children's global motion thresholds? Well, here we're looking at the San Diego group again, who also had uh, imaging um, at the same time as they did the task, the other cognitive and ball in the grass task. And what we found was that high motion sensitivity being good at the ball in the grass task in individual children was associated with expanded areas that are shown here 
on the right hand picture um, in the parietal lobe, particularly around the IPS. This has also been found in non-human primate studies where decision processes in single neurons in IPS have been using information from B5MT for particular decisions. So what we think from this is that, oh, and the secondly, we found white matter cor correlations with uh, motion uh, coherence thresholds, particularly in the superior longitudinal fasciculus. And that's a major track that goes from parietal lobe to occipital temporal and to frontal lobes and a, a, quite an elaborate network. So what we think is that the limit in children's motion sensitivity may be set by attention and decision-making processes in networks between parietal lobe and frontal lobe, rather than the decision being made at lower levels. Now, what we also found that in young Williams syndrome children, there was a abnormal white matter in parietal lobes and that probably represented early immature myelination in this tract. And uh, this we think may be related to a number of the difficulties that Williams syndrome children have over um, both motion coherence and inactions. Now there's a whole range of problems that the Williams syndrome children show, and this includes visual motor problems. Uh, when we look at uh, this idea of visual motor problems being an also a dorsal stream act activity, and, and a, a dorsal stream uh, analysis is required, uh, we see that again, this is across many developmental disorders. This table has some uh, misses uh, in it and where there isn't actually something filled in, but it shows you a range of visuomotor activities, particularly a variety of, remain, of uh, actions in the movement ABC test across fine movement, balance, and gross actions. Um, and you can see that it covers many children with a variety of developmental disorders, including amblyopia and uh, preterm birth, uh, infants who've been born prematurely. So the third part of this uh, talk is really about attention. And we think this is a further function that is largely related to the dorsal stream. This is a picture that we, uh, a diagram that we, a schematic that we set up some time ago, showing you from adult and non-human primate studies of the areas of attention in green here that overlap with many of the other areas that are related to the dorsal stream. And there may be even a few more than this now that aren't on this diagram. This is similar to the ideas that Kravitz and Mishkin put forward in a review of, in, uh, of the dorsal stream. Um, and it really talks about three dorsal streams or three dorsal networks, one for visual motor actions, one for spatial cognition at the top, and one for attention and spatial memory at the lower one. And these are the three that we think are related to each other via the dorsal stream networks, and are, but they may be different dorsal stream networks and different interactions. So we've come to dorsal stream vulnerability where there are vision motor and attention deficits um, that cover many different forms of developmental abnormality. Now, what about the hyperopes? Well, I've shown you already the graph on the bottom, which is their attention deficit at seven years for children who were significantly hyperopic in infancy. They also show mild visuomotor deficits compared to typically developing children. And they show uh, some spatial construction deficits on the block construction task. When we look at very premature infants, you can see that all the boxes here for attention, spatial location, memory, global coherence, block copying and visual motor problems, and in fact for stereo vision, are all the groups of children who are born preterm, a significantly higher number of them are showing deficits on these particular tests 
at six to seven years. And this is a large group of children, very prematurely born children. So it's common across uh, preterm children, infants with preterm, infants and children with preterm birth. And what about infancy? Well, a long time ago, we started the fixation shifts paradigm. And this was shown on the video, uh, perhaps in not quite the same format, where you have a central stimulus that the infant is looking at, which is a schematic varying face. And then when the infant is fixating the central stimulus, you switch to either a single target in the periphery, which is way above acuity threshold, or you switch to leaving the face stimulus on and switching to the same bar in the periphery. And you look for an eye movement and sometimes a head movement as well by the child to the peripheral target. Um, we can measure the latency in these later studies of these shifts. And what we find is that in general, children are slightly faster uh, if they're beyond four months of age and they can do it in both non-competition and competition. But infants around birth and in the first few months are very sluggish or very poor at actually shifting under competition. We had a confirmation that this was a cortical process of disengagement that we were looking at in competition between two targets from our work with two children who had very early hemispherectomy to relieve intractable chronic epilepsy. They were operated on at four and eight months of age. Before operations, they showed very few visual responses that were in the normal range. And after they'd had surgery and a few months later, we found that they showed no fixation shifts to the impaired half field under competition, but normal uh, fixation shifts to the good side, uh, to operating with the good side of their good hemisphere. They showed normal fixation shifts to both sides under non-competition, rather like very young newborn infants. We found deficits on fixation shift paradigms across many different developmental disorders. And this is an early sign of attentional problems in the first six months of life for many of these children, and in certainly the first year or so of life for some of these children. What about the middle age group that are preschool children? Well, more recently we've developed the ECAB, which was also shown in the video very briefly. This is a, a, consists of eight subtests with an which, where you can get an individual profile across different components of attention. So selective attention, sustained attention, and attentional control or executive function, which have, we think, correspondingly, three corresponding brain networks that may be slightly separate from each other, but also interact with each other in everyday vision from the work by Posner and, Roth and Rothbard. Uh, we've used this uh, with typically developing children and uh, the tests are, we've used the vision tests with quite a number of groups now. Uh, the vision test that you saw in the video was the selective attention test of uh, find all the red apples in a very brief di display, which lasts about a minute. Um, and the sustained attention test where it lasts about five minutes, where you're looking at sustained attention across these five minutes, uh, or as far as you can get, the younger children, uh, where they're pointing to animals. They recognize the animals and they're familiar animals. The selective attention tests of executive function show, um, uh, first of all, the, uh, the flanker test where they have to say, point to the side of the screen uh, where the fish is looking to a little star on the side of the screen for the iPad version. And for executive function, they have to point first of all to the dog to show that they can stop what where the dog is. And then they have to point to the opposite side of the screen. They don't have to make an accurate uh, point to the middle of where the dog is. They just have to point to the opposite side of the screen. And this is a counterpointing task, rather like the one that was shown in the video. Using these tests and the auditory tests as well, the auditory analog tests, on the laptop, we looked at Williams syndrome children and Down syndrome children. And what we found from Kate Breckenridge's work was that the uh, 
if we measured their general cognitive ability, we could get a scaled um, uh, equivalent score for their co general cognitive abilities, for their overall cog cognition. And then we could look at these attention tests and get the same comparable measure. And what you see is if you take their cognitive level at 10 here on the side of the graph on the vertical axis, which is the scale score, the mental age, if you like, then you can see that most of the bars fall below that line, which means that on those tasks and those for those particular components, these children show an attentional deficit which is over and above the that would be predicted from their mental age. And we see different characteristic profiles for the two disorders. They're not exactly the same. So for example, if you look at counterpointing, which is in purple here or down the bottom, you can see that the Williams syndrome children um, show a bigger deficit, which is lower yellow bar than the red bar, which is for the Down syndrome. We've also used this test in the Oxford trial of dietary supplement for children with perinatal brain injury, who, where the injury was detected at birth, usually from MRI. Uh, these children received a two-year dietary supplement, uh, which uh, is a component precursor of neuronal membranes in the hope of improving their brain development early in life. We did follow up tests at six months and 12 month intervals for these children up to seven years. I'm just going to talk about the attention tests at five years. Uh, this is the, these are the results for these children. And once again, this time, the scaled uh, score of for mental age is at 100 here on this graph. And you can see that all the yellow bars for these children with perinatal brain injury tested at five years uh, are below, and they are significantly different to the uh, scores for typically developing children. So the attention scores are lower than the mental age score, showing that these children have an additional attentional problem over and above their general cognitive abilities. We also found that actually the supplement made a slight improvement across the Franca test and the counterpointing test which are the executive function tests. So you can see that the blue bars for the children who were given the dietary supplement are higher than the orange bars for the children who weren't given the particular supplement. They were given a, a, a additional feeding, but they didn't include the supplement. Now on the iPad, we're able to see that uh, we can get more precise measures of each individual child's reaction time. And when we do this, we see even bigger differences between different attentional problems across different developmental disorders. Here's a new study that we're in the middle of really now. And uh, we're looking at uh, uh, Down syndrome and Williams syndrome. And we're looking at on the, the blue bars are the typical scores for children of three, four, or five years, three to four, four to five, five to six years from the initial typically developing children. And the uh, red score is for Downs and the yellow is for Williams syndrome. We've got the hits here on the visual search, the number of apples that they actually managed to touch in a minute's exposure to that particular, in that particular conjunction task. On the right, you can see the false positives. And one thing you see is that the Down syndrome children make many more impulsive touches of non-targets than the Williams syndrome children or than the typically developing children, which shows a different difficulty, if you like, of attention in this task. So in summary, diverse developmental disorders um, share a pattern of deficits related to, we think, the development of the dorsal stream systems. And this is one branch of the dorsal stream system. It's many. And we'll involve, and will involve forward, feed forward and feedback mechanisms in the developing brain. We found impaired global motion sensitivity in our tests, always in comparison to static form. 
we found visual spatial and visual motor deficits and we found impaired visual attention across many very different developmental disorders. These are very different in terms of both their origin and in terms of their behavioral phenotype that results from these early beginnings. And so we don't imagine that they'll all be identical in showing the severity of these disorders or the uh, timing of these disorders. So where does shared dorsal vulnerability come from? Well, dorsal functions depend on precise neural timing. This timing may be vulnerable to disruption across different neurodevelopmental disorders and possibly due to different etiologies. Dorsal stream networks are more vulnerable than ventral stream networks, perhaps during a particular sensitive period of early development. And attention and visual motor control and global motion sensitivity, they all depend, all these tasks depend to some extent in everyday vision on dorsal ventral integration. So this may be susceptible to disruption in many different networks in many different ways. So I've left you with lots of questions, but how can we conclude? The many ways in which visual, visual attention is involved in development may be a theme that links our apparently different questions. Understanding the key role of different networks of attention will advance basic scientific understanding of visual development, we hope. We need to understand the trajectories of atypical development across different disorders in a much more cohesive manner. Hopefully this may provide ways to guide future treatment and rehabilitation, allowing each child to reach their true potential. These are all the people that have been involved in quite a lot of this work and many collaborators. They're all in alphabetical order and we hope we haven't missed anybody out. But thanks particularly to the children and families who have participated in our studies. Um, thanks to the collaborative teams in vision, cognitive science, imaging, ophthalmology and paediatric neurology outside our unit who we've worked with. And we've mentioned many of these people here. And again, we are very thankful for the good collaborations we've had over many years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I invite everybody to unmute themselves and let's give um, a big applaud uh, to Oliver. This was a very interesting, inspiring uh, talk about a lifetime of uh, investigations in visual development. And I invite everybody to um, ask questions if that's okay. Yes, um, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. I think it's very informative and actually teaching our students all of your work of, of your life. It's very, very remarkable. So my question is, we know that most of infants born as hyperops, and then we have the, over the years, the the change to myopic, myopic. How are we changing actually how it's affect your study? Because you mentioned that you monitor the hyper -op, but most of them are in there. Okay, well, two things to say about that. Uh, first is yes, of course, hyperopia generally decreases um, indeed before the onset of significant myopia in most cases. And that in was our a population. Well, yes. Yes. And in, um, that was, of course, an important component of the way we carried out this trial. We had to re-refract these children regularly, uh, always, <clears throat> we never giving a full correction for hyperopia to make sure they were never over-corrected. Um, and we, this is a process sometimes known as emetropization. And our studies indicated that these prescriptions we gave didn't uh, slow or impair that rate of emetropization. The other issue to highlight here is that why is emetropization occurring? Um, or how, or through what mechanisms it's occurring? We're suggesting, and there is some evidence that um, <coughs> there, is, there are central brain processes involved in this, um, in the, perhaps mediated by the control of accommodation. 
uh, and that's part of our reasoning or part that uh, possibly there is a that hyp that persistent hyperopia and strabismus are a soft signs of some form of cerebral dysfunction. Now, if you want to add anything, to yes, that we ought to make it clear that although we screened with video refraction, uh, the refractions that were given were done from confirmed retinoscopy under cycloplegia. Um, and the two studies were slightly different in that the initial study was done with uh, screening with cycloplegia. The second study was done with what's the name, non-cycloplegia, because we realized that the children who were significantly hyperopic, uh, hyperopic with cycloplegia and over three and a half diopters in at least one meridian were also the children who uh, were showing up on the screening as being under accommodators. But as you saw, uh, the, under, they, the under accommodators were not, uh, were the ones that became strabismic and we don't have evidence for accommodative strabismus in this particular group, except for a very small percentage of children. Thank you. Who also yeah. say that this was largely a Caucasian population and we might have got very different results if we'd have looked at different ethnic groups. Thank you. So I have another comment, what Oliver said. Actually, once I talked with uh, Gerald Boisheimer, he told me that the only thing that they, with the feedback, that they, we don't have feedback to the eye, but what you mentioned now, the accommodation basically is controlled by feedback to the eye. So maybe mm -hmm. all this the process is going back. I think the point is that my understanding is that in mammals at least, and this is not, this is not necessarily true for instance in birds, there is no neural feedback to the retina from higher centers. However, there is the, the obvious feedback loop uh, involving um, <coughs> uh, ocular motor and of course accommodative responses. These are responses that are controlled by central mechanisms, but determine the, the input to the retina. So there is, there is a feedback from the brain to the eye, it just goes through the outside world and through the muscles, if you want to put it that way. Very interesting, thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. About the dosal vulner vulnerability how sensitive this was to the difficulty of the task? It could be that maybe the form uh, was easier on a for a typical uh, individuals and then he, um, the, the tasks were not equal in difficulty. Could that be a part of the difference? Well, well, we did try to match on the adults the difficulty of the task. And in fact, on the larger adult groups that we've tested, we haven't actually at that stage got a significant difference. Although there are individual differences, there are adults, adults who find one of the forms, either the form or the motion more difficult. Whether this is the same problem in, ch in, in children, we don't know, but we tried to match our tasks as well as possible for a task that typically developing children between three and six years could do easily. And they didn't find it a terribly difficult task. I mean, the other thing you should point but out- It seemed that, that, that in your, in your uh, slides that there was a difference between the form and the dozen in the typical population. Or maybe well, I missed it. It could be that I missed it. No, no, that's with age. With, uh, through age, through the different yeah. ages. Yes. yes, but that's what we did with the uh, children with so they are not matched in that sense. I mean, well, they're not matched except well. Two points. First, first is that the um, <clears throat> the threshold is determined by an adaptive procedure, right? So you're always you're always testing at the level where the children are getting about seventy percent correct. That's that. Got you. Okay, that's important. Yeah. Now I understand. Okay. Thanks. So, so, so yes, the um, but in that sense, and the other thing is the tasks are designed be as similar as possible. In fact, the, the little arcs used in the form coherence task are simply the same dots that you would plot in the, to get the motion, only they're, um, they're plotted simultaneously rather successively. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily match the difficulty. And as Jan has pointed out, difficulty is not matched as a function of age. So the, 
The four year, among the four and five year olds, the motion thresholds are, are substantially higher, and then they tend to converge as you get as you get older. So there is something about the motion task that makes it that makes it difficult. We agree, and that, in a sense, is the is the core of the argument. Yeah, um, but we don't think in the sort of superficial aspects of the demands, one is more harder than the other, and the way it's tested is designed to minimise that difference. And and we we really would have liked other people who found this. A global motion deficit in other developmental disorders to have attempted uh, something that was a, a control condition for form because otherwise it is rather easy in developmental disorders to find um, a lower response than in typically developing children. So uh, we think this is quite important for looking at other disorders and always to have uh, a normalization and quite a lot of results from typically developing children of the same mental age um, for these particular tasks, because otherwise you're just pointing out the difficulties that are fairly obvious with some of these children with developmental disorders because they have a lower mental age. I think one other thing we should point out or admit, if you like, is that of course, the motion stimulus in particular um, is one, one element in a huge parameter space. That is, we have used a, a particular velocity, we've used a particular yes. limited lifetime of the dots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a, some work has gone on um, looking at the different developmental course that's dependent on velocity, for instance, but that's just one parameter uh, in the stimulus that we use. And whether the stimulus we use is actually the Optimum. The optimum one for revealing these differences, I think, is going to be very hard to determine uh, unless there's a big effort to explore that parameter space. Um, I'd also like to ask, I mean, this is uh, really interesting, the fact that you found uh, all these deficits in uh, dorsal related functions. Um, I want to ask if you, if these individuals um, you you think you can um, um, rule out the possibilities that they also have ventral related uh, functional uh, deficits? I mean, is it mostly concentrated in dorsal? And if that's the case, then do you think this is like um, kind of like completing a double dissociation between the uh, dorsal and ventral uh, separation or independence? I, I don't think it's as simple as that. Um, I think what we're arguing at the moment is that um, a lot of these deficits may originate in earlier attention deficits and controlling eye movements as well as, ever, you know, which is what you're looking at in the fixation shifts. And that if we look at the tasks that we've uh, demonstrated in this talk, they contain a ventral element very often, as well as a dorsal element. And so I, we're personally in favor of this being dorsal vulnerability in terms of vulnerability at a particular stage of development, possibly more in the dorsal stream than the ventral stream, perhaps in these early attention mechanisms. And that having a a problem for the child when they have to integrate information across many different processing streams. I think, I think the point we do have to emphasize is that in our work, we're always trying to do it by a comparison of the, in, or at least in, in the coherence task, a comparison of, of, of form and motion. Uh, now, men, I'm not, we're not saying these children are up to normal levels on the form coherence task, it's just that their impairment there is much less than for the for the motion yes. coherence task. We would want to encourage people who study developmental disorders. And for instance, there's an awful lot of people who have looked at uh, motion de deficits in autism, and there's a, quite a controversy about that, but um, only a minority of those studies have actually compared motion with a, a task that is designed to be comparable, but that's, 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 what, that's what we've done. And in some of our developmental orders, uh, developmental disorders, there are, there are quite wide individual differences and we have some children in the group that show deficits on form and motion but usually 
it's the way round that we'd expect for dorsal vulnerability rather than ventral disability. But they do show poorer results than the typically developing children at that, equi at that equivalent age. I, th I think one last point to make about this is that um, are, there any are there any disorders which appear to show a predominantly ventral stream yes. problem? And the only one we can think of, but maybe people have better examples, is so-called developmental prosopagnosia. There are yes. certainly or big there are individuals with a, a very poor level of face recognition. Um, they've mostly been tested ad as adults, so I think one of two uh, cases now which have been identified where this kind of deficit is present and specific from an early age. So it is possible to have a, a, a ventral stream deficit. It just seems, from what we know, to be much less widespread uh, than uh, and, and much more specific than dorsal stream deficits. I, can I make can I make a comment? Yes. yes. We we did many years ago an fMRI study of amblyops, and we found a selective and severe deficit in face. Uh, in face uh, area activation in the amblyops, so yes. that's typically considered ventral stream. So, uh, sure. I'm yes. kind, of, kind of ask then, was that accompanied by a, a behavioral deficit in there? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, amblyops, you know, severe amblyops have very difficulty recognizing faces because it's a very foveal uh, function. So, that definitely okay. well, was. We We'll, we'll look for that reference. It sounds interesting. Thank yeah, yeah. You. Um, I'll send it to you. I'll be happy to send it to you. Yeah, Thank it, you. I, what I'd be interested in there, were they poor at recognizing faces when they were in motion? I think, I think we was, did not know of your beautiful I results. So. I think this is an interesting question. Yeah, that, absolutely. About face so. recognition, yeah. because a lot of people who recognize the body movements and the facial movements of individuals for emotional uh, signals and mm -hmm. it seems to me that doing it with static faces may not be getting to the bottom of it. Well that opens Absolutely. up Absolutely. Which we haven't studied but others have of biological recognizing biological motion and it's been striking that well better as an individual I mean this is slightly off point because we're looking at a specific deficit we believe of B5 but for instance uh, seals um patient who was uh, apparently quotes motion blind in many respects was relatively good at recognizing patterns of action by biological motion and there are a number of other examples of that kind so that's that's a that's a route by which motion information is getting into temporal areas uh and may it's an interesting question as to how far that may, is spared when other aspects of motion processing are apparently impaired um, I want to suggest, uh, yeah, Avi, I see that. Sorry, you're sorry the time, I don't have the time. If not, you can do it via uh, afterwards via mail, I guess. No, no, it's okay. I just, I just want to uh, mention just one uh, note, one thing that I think maybe people who have ventral stream-related deficits are less uh, detected by society as having uh, perceptual issues because. The syndromes that you are describing are ones that are evidently seen by just uh, neurotypical. I mean, these are people that you can detect there's something developmentally um, deficient in them. Whereas even prosopagnosics or even people with visual agnosia or people who um, have trouble acquiring reading are not, you don't see that in daily behavior. It's something that only when you go into that very specific uh, function that you see that deficit when they are trying to decipher the visual inputs, but it's not in their daily behavior that you see it. Um, it's just a thought. Um, uh, I, uh, the only comment I can make there is that we used to uh, decide whether children were in the hyperopic group or the typical group. Um, uh, when they when we were watching them in our unit mm. and one thing that we noticed was that very often you could spot children who weren't accommodating well particularly even if they didn't even if they didn't have any spectacles or anything in their actions and in their general behavior and so that led us to the other tests that we did with those children when they were older. And so I think in quite a lot of the disorders we talked about, 
you wouldn't necessarily, for example, in the very premature, a lot of those, those children had normal intelligence on intelligent tests, and you wouldn't necessarily notice that they had any problems with some of the more subtle aspects of the tests that we were doing, like attention in everyday vision. Thank you. Um, I think we, have, we should emphasize that these are, the groups we're talking about are not groups who are identified primarily on the basis of their visual or visual motor difficulties. Uh, they're diagnosed on quite other grounds and then, for instance, by perinatal brain damage way before uh, any behavioral tests can be done. <coughs> and that they then exhibit these particular patterns of behavioral deficit. Okay. Do you have time to take more questions? Sure, if, uh, if you, if have, you time. have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have time. Uh, Avi, do you want to uh, yeah, ask? Um, if, I, if I followed correctly, you explained that there was the group with the lag of accommodation of over one and a half diopters, um, as in they were poor accommodators. Um, and the, the, the prevalence there of isotropia was higher, showing, um, and if I understood correctly, you, you took from that that um, poor accommodation, it, it wasn't due to accommodation or even poor accommodation seemed to then result in esotropia. Is it possible that the poor accommodators, um, with, with clinically what we call an ACA ratio, as the amount of convergence driven by accommodation for someone who's struggling with accommodation would actually be higher, which is something we see clinically. So even though the lag of accommodation would be larger, the amount of accommodation resulting from what their attempt to accommodate would also be higher. My only reasoning for asking is because if so, um, would we see a difference between ESO and exotropes? And have you looked at the differences obviously within, um, if it's uh, tension driven, um, why would they end up esotropic and not exotropic? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I, think, I think what you're suggesting is essentially the first of the two alternative possibilities that, were at the, that Jan presented at the end of that, uh, yeah. of that segment yeah. of the talk. I mean, yes, there is a possibility um, that, the ch that some, some children uh, under accommodate because when they attempt to accommodate, they have a, a high AC over A uh, and, and that, cause, that causes uh, a breakdown of convergence. So that, that's, that's, one, that's one possible route and we, we haven't got any, any evidence um, on the question of, of exotropia, um, we, we just at this stage saw very, very few exotropes. I don't think we can say anything about that group. No. Thank you and very much. There's no, there's, there is also the possibility that these, these other deficits are a combination of both those theories. I mean, there's no reason why one should exclude the other. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, it would be nice to have a way of testing AC over A in a nine-month-old <laughs> infant. Um, there is a little evidence. Uh, I mean, uh, there is um, a, a Rowan Candice group yeah. in Indiana is essentially attempting to do that, but it's hard work. Right. But that, I'm assuming at nine months old that those systems are still very fluid and developing anyway. So the, the lack of accommodation at that age would be different, even if you were able to, which I guess you can from different dynamic, dynamic retinoscopies. Um, and if you were able to do that whilst doing eye tracking, you would be able to position the eyes at different levels of accommodation. I mean, I think that's essentially what um, Rowan what, what, what Candy's work yeah. is, try, is trying to do, yeah. Yeah, but the, the problem is the, um, the uh, technological limitations of the eye trackers and the uh, amount of movement of the uh, of the eyes. Okay, and sorry, one uh, last thing. Um, with regards to the pointing, um, assuming that a lot of the individuals and the types of syndromes you mentioned also have general um, motor um, developmental delays, um, is how much of it's visual and how how much of it's um, a motor response? Well, I don't think you can really separate it. Um, okay. Most of the tests haven't demanded very precise movements in a very limited time period. Okay. And on the iPad, we've accepted the point to the animals, for example, for two presentations afterwards of the, the next stimuli. 
So the child has made the response and we've never had two animals on top of each other so that you don't confuse one response with another. For the counterpointing, we're not looking for an accurate point. We're looking for one hand going in one direction or the other direction. And some of the children cheat, of course, by trying to put the point in the middle. Um, and for the apples, this is not a very precise vision that you need to make. Um, it's more in the visual components than the motor components. And we've understood that. We would like to have a test. I mean, and for the crowded cards, we've tested children with quite heavy uh, visual motor problems in cerebral palsy, and they're still able to respond on the board to the approximately where the letter is that's in the center. They don't have to make a precise hand movement in any of our tasks. Yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> in the ball in the grass task, um, they, there's, they, we want them to touch the screen where they see the coherent region, but um, it's only a left right thing. It's not touching with any precision. And of course, just to emphasize once again, it's always the comparison of the performance on the motion and the form tests, which involve the same motor response. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure having you with us. I hope you'll join us uh, to hear uh, additional talks during the series this year. Um, I invite yeah. everybody again to give a big applaud to Jan and Oliver for a wonderful talk. Um, and we'd like, we'd like to thank you, Sharon, for taking the opportunities caused by the limit, global limitations of COVID to set up a seminar series that's actually more global than anything we've ever encountered before. We yeah, really for, for all of us, it's, yeah, <laughs> at least some uh, evolution of some positive aspects. Um, yeah. yeah, it's the good side of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. As Rafi said uh, already a while back that this is one of his uh, most wonderful uh, experiences, uh, being all over the world in uh, uh, different talks. Um, um, I, isn't it and isn't it? And as we would like to emphasize with a cup of coffee. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and we would like to emphasize that if anybody did want to contact us, we're available on email. Available on email or, or Zoom, Skype, whatever. Or Zoom, Skype, or whatever, anything whatever else. your medium. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And if anybody Thank needs uh, Jan and Oliver's uh, contact details and cannot find them, uh, I'm happy for to be contacted to send you the uh, their email. Um, I would want to say that next week, at the same time, we have Professor Julie Harris who will be talking about shape from shading in nature. Does it uh, provide optimal camouflage, which I hope um, across um, animals and stuff like that. And it sounds like a fascinating, very different topic. Uh, I hope you'll be able to join us. Um, and have a, a nice week, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it will be up on the um, uh, YouTube channel, I hope, even today. Uh, your right. talk, your recorded talk. If that's okay. That's, that's fine. fine. Lovely. Bye now. Bye. Bye bye.